Greeting and salutations. I am Lloyd, a producer at LCD Productions, and I have come to share these new series of visual audiobooks with you, the listener, the supporter, the viewer. Together we will go on a journey like never before, fly to new heights with Project Aerospace, explore new land and cityscapes with flotations, even change the dimension of time through the power of time-lapse photography from live to tape. We'll even travel beyond the mind's eye into worlds captured and generated through animation from Thumbs United Daily Animation Series. As we together go on these journeys filled with photography and theater of the mind, I hope you remember the core belief that we hold, that anyone can become the master of art, meaning that it is not some born skill what makes someone good at being creative. It is a desire to practice and spend time being creative that creates the master. I hope that these films photography, and stories inspire you to set some time aside and practice some creativity. I believe if we all spend more time creating and being constructive, the world would be a better place, a more friendlier and fulfilling place. Thank you for coming. Let's begin this journey. This is Live to Tape in partnership with Project Aerospace, recording the visual audiobook of the Girl Aviators and the Phantom Airship. Chapter 23, Like Thieves in the Night. Heard anything of Fanning Harding? Asked Jimsy one bright morning as he stopped his car at the Prescott's gate and he gave Jess as he and Jess got out. Not a thing since that day at Acknet, responded Roy, who, who with his sister had hastened to meet the other two. Why, Jess, how charming of you, how charming you look this morning. Meaning that you noticed the contrast with other mornings, laughed Jess merrily. Oh, Roy, you're not a courtier. No, I guess not yet. Whatever a courtier may be, was the laughing, was the laughing rejoinder. But I always like to pay deserved compliments. Oh, that's better, cried Jess. But have you heard anything from Mr. Bell? For, of course, Jimsy and Jess by this time knew about the visit of the mining man. Mr. Bancroft had looked up his standing and character and had found both of the highest on his advice Roy had about decide on his advice Roy had about decided to accept the unique offer made him by the Western millionaire. Peggy shook her head in response to Jess's question. No, dear, not one word, she said. Isn't it queer? However, I guess we shall before long Oh, I do hope that poor old hermit turns out to be Mr. Jim Bell's brother. So do I, too, agreed Jimsy. It would be a jolly for you and Roy to think that you and your airplane had been the means of writing such a succession of mishaps. Indeed it would, agreed Peggy warmly. But now come into the house and have some ice cream. It's one sign of our new prosperity that we are never without it now. I've eaten so much of it I'm ashamed to look at a freezer in the face left Roy as they trooped in to the warmly welcomed by Mrs. Prescott. In the midst of their merry feast, the sound of wheels was heard, and a rig from the station drove up. Out it stepped a venerable old gentleman in a well-fitted dark suit with well-blackened shoes and altogether neat and prosperous appearance. Peggy and Jess, who had run to the widow window at the sound of the wheels, saw him assisted to the ground by a younger man whom they both recognized with a cry of astonishment. Mr. Jim Bell, but who is this old gentleman? Why, it's the hermit, cried Roy. Good gracious, is that fashionable-looking old man a hermit? gasped Jimsy. He was, I guess, but he won't be any more, laughed Peggy, happily as she tripped to the door to welcome the visitors. The Prescott had a maid now, but Peggy preferred to be the first to greet the newly united brothers, for it was evident that Jim Bell's quest had been successful. But greetings there were, to be sure, when the two brothers were inside the cool, shady house. The hermit's eyes gleamed delightfully as gallantly handed Mrs. Prescott to a chair. As for Jim Bell, he was happy enough to dance a jig. He said, I'll pay for you. I'll play for you, sir, volunteered Jimsy, going toward the piano. No, no, laughed Jim Bell. I'm too old for that now, but not too old for Peter and I to have many happy days together yet, eh, Peter? 
He turned tenderly toward the old man, whose eyes grew dim and moist. I wish Dad and Mother could see us now, he said. Sadly, his thoughts wandered back over the long, bitter years he had spent in solitude. Perhaps they can, breathed Peggy softly. Let us hope so. Thank you, said the old hermit with a sigh. But the conversation soon turned to a merrier vein, and they drifted into business. Mr. Brancraft happened to stop in on his way into town, and after a long talk with Jim Bell and seriously advised Roy to accept the mining man's proposal. I'll put you up a factory any place you say, said the millionaire, and you can turn out what all that we require. I have a notion, too, that they might be used as general freight carriers over a rid stretch of the country, where there are no railroads, and feed and water for stocks is scarce. No doubt of it, said Mr. Bancroft. Before he left, the preliminary papers had been drawn up and signed, and Roy Prescott found himself fairly launched in business. But in all his success, he did not forget how much he owed to Peggy. Recent events had softened the boy's character, and reduced its conceit wonderfully. I owe it all to you, little sis, he said that evening. I don't know all I don't know about all, cried Jimsy, who was present, but you owe a whole lot to her, old man, and I'm glad to see you acknowledge it at last. I always have, cried Roy, turning rather red though. Hmm, commented Jimsy. I'm not so sure about that. But Peggy put her hand over his mouth and it took Jimsy what seemed an awfully undue long time to remove it. As for Jess, she stalwartly declared that if it hadn't been for Peggy, there would have been no golden butterfly, no $5,000 prize, and, as she said, no nothing. But to the loyal little Peggy would not assent, and her eyes Roy would always remain the most wonderful brother in the world. Soon after this, Jimsy and Jess took their leave, and it was not long before the last light of the extinguished was extinguished in the happy little household, and the deep silence reigned. About midnight, as nearly as she could judge, Peggy awoke to find the moonlight streaming into her room and upon her face. Good gracious, I'll get moonstruck, she thought, and throwing up a wrap, she went to the window to pull down the shade, which had been raised to admit the cool air. The window commanded a view of the workshop in which the golden butterflies kept, and Peggy was, and as Peggy looked out, was astonished to see the door of the workshop which housed the precious craft was opened. Goodness, thought the girl, how careless of whoever left it that way. The night air will rust the stray wires and the steel parts of the motor assembly. I guess I had better slip downstairs and close it. Partially dressing herself, the girl noiselessly tipped downstairs and out into the moonlight. For an instant, she was startled as she thought she saw a dark form dodge swiftly behind the corner of the workshop as she appeared. It must be getting, I must be getting as nervous as poor Roy when the mule frightened him down the well, she thought to herself as she advanced toward the shed. Reaching it, she raised her hand to shut the door, and to her astonishment, she discovered that it had been apparently locked. At least a broken bit of the padlock dangled from the portal seemed to indicate this. Somebody's filled at the was Peggy's thought, but before she could make any further investigation, a pair of hands grasped from behind, pinned her arms against her side, and the same instant an old coat was flung over her head and pulled close, stuffing her outcries. We won't hurt you if you keep quiet, hissed a voice in her ear, but if you don't, look out for trouble. What are you going to do? cried Peggy through the muffled medium of the coat. You'll soon find out, was the rejoinder. Juke brings her inside the shed and keep her quiet. Juke, the name struck a familiar chord in Peggy's memory. She knew now why the face of the form of the man hanging about Fanny's phantom hangar at the aviation field had seemed so familiar to her. It was Juke Day, the man who, the man her father had per, permanently, permanently discharged. Peggy could not repress a shudder she thought of the desperate character of this man. Suddenly, as her captors half dragged, half carried her into the workshop, her body grew limp, and she fell in an insensible heap forward. She would have struck the ground if not a pair of hands caught her. She's fainted, cried Duke alarmingly. So much the better, growled his companion. She won't give us any trouble now. We can do what we've got to do and get away. 
Got the files? Here they are, responded you. Just let, just let me lay her down here while I hand them to you. He deposited Peggy's limbs for limp form along the box where some axe had been thrown. The next instant, the sharp rasping of the file could be heard in the silent workshop. I guess this golden butterfly will have its wings clipped for some time to come, chuckled Juke's companion, whom Peggy, of course, had not seen. I guess that's right, laughed the other. Just wait a jiffy while I lay down this gun of mine, and I'll give you a second hand. He stepped over and put down a wicked-looking pistol on the rough bent rough bench on which Peggy lay. Then he turned and began to help his companion. The two worked by the light of the dark lantern, which they had brought with them on their rascally expedition to ruin the golden butterfly. But suddenly a slight noise behind him made Juke turn his head, and as so, he gave a startled yell. Peggy, her eyes bright and wild-looking, was standing up behind them. In her hand was the pistol which Juke had laid down beside her when she had seemed to faint, a few moments before, but Peggy's faint had been a stimulated one. Realizing the harm was meant to the golden butterfly, she had immediately unconsciously, as a means to possibly escape, given the, given the alarm. Don't move, either of you, said Peggy in a firm voice. I'm only a girl, but I can use a pistol. But Juke and his companions, with wild yell, made a dash for the door. Good gracious, I can't shoot them, thought Peggy. Help, help, she began to cry at the top of her voice. But the next instant, the whirl and roar of the motor from the road apprised her that the two rascals had made their escape in an auto, and the pursuit was useless. Thus was that when the aroused household came pouring excitedly out of the house, they were found a brave but rather tremulous girl awaiting them with a pistol in her hand and the stock, which were engraved the initials F.H., so that's whose Juke's companion was, exclaimed Roy angrily. Oh, if you had awakened me, sis. My dear Roy, rejoined Peggy with a dignity, don't you think I am capable of taking care of myself? The next chapter is chapter four, chapter 24. Here, Hester makes amends. Conclusion. Thank you for experiencing this journey we have created here at LCD Productions. For more information on how to support these films and projects, visit fortations.com forward slash support. Fine art photography prints from journeys around the world can be purchased from fortationsstore.com. And digital downloads of our photography and visual audiobooks is available for personal use. Commercial use is available at a different rate. Thank you for your time. I hope to see you here again.